It's my privilege to introduce Wayne Walker as our chapel speaker today. He serves as CEO, and get this, pastor to the homeless. That's wonderful, isn't it? For our calling. In 2001, Wayne, along with his wife, Carolyn, began to serve the homeless community in Dallas, Texas, and in 2009, they founded Our Calling. During his youth, Wayne's family actively pursued the scriptural commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, by modeling the life of Jesus to scores of foster children whose own origins represented generations of human brokenness, dysfunction, sexual exploitation, and abuse. Early exposure to these destructive forces set him on a path to recognize the long-term effects of trauma, which often lead to homelessness. While completing his master's degree in cross-cultural ministry from Dallas Theological Seminary, Wayne befriended and ministered to men and women in the homeless community. And during that time, he began to establish personal discipleship-oriented relationships with homeless individuals many in the same urban setting where he and his family continue to work today. It's been wonderful to uh, share life with Wayne over these years. We've known each other about 20 years. Uh, his son, Logan, is, is like a third son to me. And uh, this, is, uh, this man here is the real deal. And I did want to point out we have our brother, uh, Ed, who is director of programs for Our Calling, also joining Come up and talk to these men and find out how you can get involved. Help me welcome Wayne Walker, please. It's great to see you, buddy. Well, my lovely wife could not be here today. She's driving to Austin to attend a symposium for some work thing, you know, crazy homeless ministry stuff. We're always learning from other people. And so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I want to share with you, first off, the worst part of my job. I love my job. I love what I get to do. But I want to share with you the absolute worst part of my job. And it's making the call. I have to look up a phone number I maybe have never dialed. And I pray before I do this. And I pick up the phone. And I talk to someone and it sounds like this. Yeah, Mr. Jones, yes. My name is Wayne Walker. I'm a pastor in Dallas. I work with the homeless. Yes, yes, we know your son. Yes, we've known him for many, many years. He's attended Bible studies here and, and he's been a, a healthy, great part of our community. No, no, sir, that's not why I'm calling today. I'm calling to tell you the one thing that you've been fearful for all your life. Your son was found dead at a homeless camp yesterday. I have made that call more times than I want to. It's pretty gross. The world is hurting. Life is not good. People are suffering. It's all around us. And in the midst of that, God is calling us to do something to respond. Now, you may not get a call from on the road to Damascus. You may not see a burning bush. But the Lord will flip your script and call you where he wants you to be. And today I want to take a minute and look at part of the story of Moses from Exodus chapter 3. If you have a Bible, pull it out, flip to Exodus chapter 3 or turn off Instagram and go to there on your phone. We want to look at Moses chapter 3, and what we're going to see there is that God responds to a broken world by sending broken people to do his work. God responds to a broken world by sending broken people to do his work. Exodus chapter 3, I'm going to read the whole piece, and then we'll kind of dissect it, uh, starting in verse 7 through verse 12. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached to me. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. The very beginning of that section in chapter 3, verses 7, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. God sees misery. I'm going to ask you seven different questions related to that, to these different I statements from God. And the first of those is, can you see the misery? People are living in absolute misery. The Hebrew people were slaves. In Dallas, we have over 10,000 people experiencing homelessness. Dallas Independent School District counts over 3,500 kids living in homelessness. We have senior citizens that aren't in a retirement community. They have no pension. They're living in crippling conditions, being abandoned on the streets. Dallas is also a major hub for sex trafficking. We have victims of domestic violence, all kinds of trafficking, elder abuse, and abandonment every day. We see mothers living in their cars or tents with infants, Kidnapped victims, missing persons, we find babies, we find bodies, everything. It is absolute misery on the streets of Dallas. I'm a pastor. I have a degree from DTS, right? I took classes in theology and Greek and Hebrew and all those other things. And yet, I've treated gunshot wounds. I found people who have attempted suicide. Overdosed, been beaten unconscious and seen more nasty wounds than I care to describe. I've seen and been with people when they've taken their last breath. And I've discipled people who've been murdered. And I've discipled people who've committed murder. Ministry itself can be misery. Your world, this world, your world, this city, your city is in misery. Can you see it? Because there are broken people everywhere. The next thing God says is, I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. Question, do you hear crying? I cannot remember the first time someone came to me after recently been assaulted. I don't mean like the day after or the hour after, I mean the moment after. But hundreds of times people have cried in my arms telling me about what just happened as we call an ambulance or call the police. But there are no tears and no cry like those of a woman who's been brutally assaulted. I've had my shirts stained with tears and blood more times than I can count. Do you hear the crying? Cries from a child with hunger pangs or the terror of a woman's eyes fleeing domestic violence. But out of all those cries, there's one cry that I think stands out among the most. Among those is the worst. About a month ago, my wife and I were attending a funeral for a 19-year-old boy who was found dead at a homeless camp. There were lots of tears in that room from lots of people who had ministered to him well over the years. Those that had reached out to him, those that loved him, those that tried to encourage him, those tried to walk with him. But there was one cry that stood out. After the service, the father was introduced to an our calling staff member named TJ. TJ is one of our care ministers. He worked with this young boy's father trying to get him into a treatment program. And we did, we got him into numerous programs, but one after another, this young boy would leave, not because he was stubborn, not because he was foolish, he left because he was sick. He left because mental health can lead people down dark paths to dangerous places. 
Now, the distinct cry that day came from this father weeping in agony over the loss of his son. Or maybe the cry from his mom, who was literally melting in a pool of grief as my wife was trying to hold her up from hitting the floor. There's lots of crying. I have crawled under many bridges with families looking for their children. Children looking for their parents, sisters looking for a brother, families begging their loved ones to come off the streets. Why are they on the streets? Why are they homeless? They are slaves to poverty. Some are slaves to an illness, difficult to address, but most are crying in isolation. The number one cause of homelessness is not mental illness, it's not addiction. There are more people with mental illness and addiction living in homes than will ever be on the street. The number one cause of homelessness is broken community. They're crying in isolation because oftentimes no one cares. They are alone. They are broken people. And broken people create a broken community. God hears their crying. Can you hear it? Then God says, and I'm concerned about their suffering. Are you concerned with suffering? When I was in seminary, I was concerned with passing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Bira walks up to me. I still think there's a quiz coming, you know. Uh, or completing assignment on time. I was concerned with my marriage. We had just moved to Dallas. We had one young child. We had a newborn. I had left the software development world and took a job at a church because I thought that's what the Lord wanted us to do. I was getting job offers in the high six figures in the late 90s before some of you were born. And I left that to took a, take a job at a church making less than 20,000 a year. We had concerns. It wasn't about the homeless. It was about trying not to be, right, homeless. <laughs> but by my second semester at DTS, I needed an outlet for all the theological, all the academia, a place to practice what I was preaching so on a whim, on a bulletin that was being passed out at church, it said, go down and feed the homeless on Friday nights. That was in 2001, and I haven't stopped going since. But see, this wasn't ever the plan, right? I, I was going to be an academic. I thought I was going to graduate with all these honors and get the preaching award and, and maybe go get a PhD and, and maybe be a professor, my wife and I served in the Middle East during college and we thought, hey, we're gonna go back and work with Muslims. We're gonna go back and work with refugees. That's where the Lord calls us. We had already worked with a mission board. We, we already thought about the process to start you know, creating a, a, a raising funds and, and a donor base for that. That was the plan. But then the Lord showed us something he was concerned about and our whole future flipped. We had it all scripted out and he flipped the script on us. Because God had concerns that were different than ours. We never wanted to start a nonprofit. We'd started businesses before. Kind of can't stop doing that. My wife is an amazing administrator, and this wasn't the plan. But the more we saw, the more we knew we couldn't unsee what we have seen. We saw misery, we heard crying, and God is concerned with suffering. What concerns you? In Exodus, we read the words of the Lord, I'm concerned about their suffering. And then he was going to do something crazy. The next statement he said is, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. God comes to rescue. Question I have for you is, what are you here for? Now, let me, under, let me explain this to you. God comes to rescue. Moses didn't rescue people. There's nothing you or I can ever do that will ever be called rescue. God does the rescuing. We have search and rescue teams that go out in the woods. That's what we call them, but we search, God rescues. That's how it works. Our teams are out six days a week. We will visit over 3,000 locations this year throughout Dallas. God comes to rescue. What are you here for? They are slaves. They were slaves. The Hebrew people were slaves. They were being treated like slaves. God wasn't talking about freedom and rights. He wasn't sending Moses to schedule protest pickets and sit-ins. 
He was coming to rescue them. He wasn't giving them work gloves to make the slavery less hard. He was coming to rescue them. We work with men, women, and children living through hell. He isn't sending the church to give out better tents. We're not here to pass out sandwiches or snow cones. The church's job is not to help them be fat, happy, and homeless. The church's job is to help people escape the misery, escape the crying. He's concerned with their suffering. He wants to rescue them. For years, we thought the best thing to do was just to love people where they are, right? I can remember in in the early years, um, I was taking classes with Prof. Hendricks and I would take his Bible study methods and uh, I had a job at a church, so I had keys and probably wasn't supposed to do this, but I'd unlock the doors at night and bring guys in from an AA meeting I was going to and we'd go through Bible study methods. We'd watch the old VHS tapes and talk about hermeneutics, right? Uh, observation, uh, application, interpretation, right? We talk about all this stuff. We were looking at discipleship from an academic view. Can they learn Bible study methods? Can they learn basic hermeneutics? Can they understand sanctification, ecclesiologies, memorize scripture, share their faith? That's important stuff, right? That's not so important when your house is on fire. When your house is on fire, it's not time to sit down and have a Bible study. It's time to get out of the house. Maybe the spiritual disciplines we wanna see are not the same thing they teach at BSF or navigators or crew. Maybe the spiritual disciplines we see are a little different. Our calling is still a discipleship ministry, but you won't find a curriculum being taught. We focus on two things, very simple, but very challenging. Two questions our staff ask every single day. The first is, will you trust the Lord? The second is, will you let us help you off the streets? We want to disciple people to walk with Jesus and get off the streets. It is important for them to escape. It is important for them to be rescued by the Lord. We didn't always do that. We used to just share the gospel with people. We used to just try to teach them Bible study methods. Well, I would take groups of guys, homeless men, to share the gospel at different places in town. I thought that was pretty awesome. You know, the funeral I was in a few weeks ago was probably the 200th time I have personally known someone that's died. And I'm not exaggerating. This is not hyperbole. We have about 250 deaths in Dallas every year on the streets. I've been doing this for 20 years. You do the math. That's a lot of people. I haven't known all of them, but I've probably known over 200 people personally that have died. Some I've been there when they're taking their last breath. Many I've called their families or our teams have found them or we got called by the, the medical examiner asking for emergency contact because they found them. Lots and lots of death. You know, we were trying to disciple people and I learned pretty early on that it's kind of hard to disciple dead people. I'll tell you, I have four kids and I love them dearly. I have one daughter and, you know, dads always have a special place in their heart for their daughters. My daughter is a beautiful 20-year-old woman. If she were on the streets today, I know exactly what would be happening to her all day and all night. If she were on the streets today, I know exactly what would be happening to her all day and all night, every day, over and over and over again. If she were on the streets, I wouldn't want you to go find her and give her a new Bible. I don't want you to go give her a blanket or a tent. I don't want you to give a sandwich. I don't want you to go share the gospel with her. I don't want you to lay your hand on her and pray for her 30 seconds and say, I hope it gets better, I'll see you next week. I want you to do whatever it takes to help her escape. God wants to rescue people. I'm I'm sick of it. I've known too many people that have died. I'm tired of it. I'm burned by it. I'm wounded by it. I'm scarred by it. I'm sick of it. I go to a counselor for it and it's everywhere. And I'm not the only one who's sick of it. I think God is too. Do you see misery? Do you hear crying? Are you concerned with suffering? What are you here for? 
And then he says in verse nine, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Next question, can you see oppression? Can you see oppression? Well, what is that? Unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power. Egypt was in charge. They used their authority in unjust and cruel ways as power over powerless people. Let me get a little personal here. To my white brothers and sisters in the room, please quit talking about Black Lives Matter and start showing up and doing something. It's time to shut up and show up because real oppression happened and happens. There are problems in every political movement. I won't go there, but we must face the reality that real oppression has happened under our noses, in our country, in our churches, in our businesses, and in our homes. It's happened under our watch. A report came out in 2018 called Supporting Partnerships for Anti-Racist Communities, the Spark Report. And it said in Dallas, 18.7% of Dallas is black. That's what the census shows. It's what it is. But among those living in deep poverty, it's almost 31% are black. Among those that are homeless, 66.7% are black. It doesn't make sense. That was in 2018. Why is less than 19% of Dallas black, but of the homeless community, 66% of them are black? They're powerless, and something has happened that's unjust. This is our city. Now, we didn't personally cause this, but we own it. And we are responsible to do something about it. Dr. King said, I have a dream that one day little black boys and girls will be holding hands with little white boys and girls. How about we start at that home? When's the last time someone that didn't look like you was sitting at your dinner table at your home? I believe that little black boys and girls and little white boys and girls will only be doing what's been modeled to them at home by their parents. There's still oppression today. Brokenness is the number one contributing factor to homelessness. Brokenness. But that alone won't cause it. You also have to have poverty. So take this, two hands. One hand is empty because no one will hold it. And you are alone. The other hand is empty because you have no money. You have poverty in it. Where those two empties come together, you have homelessness. You have no community and no money. Crisis is going to happen. No money, no community creates homelessness. I don't want to go into politics, but we need to financially be ready to help communities in need. To put someone in an apartment, a boarding home, or even some of the best sex trafficking recovery programs is not cheap. They're very expensive. And some of the best ones are not free and they're not close. And we need to be willing to do whatever it takes to be the body of Christ and step up and do the right thing. At our calling, as of two weeks ago, we have helped over a thousand people exit homelessness this calendar year, right? That's cool. That's cool stuff. We built some software that analyzes people on 100 data points and all these agencies around the country. We create 700 different exit strategies, basically playing match.com to get the person in the best place. And the best may not be close and it may not be cheap. How does this relate to oppression? Well, we have baby boomers who don't have enough retirement to survive. We have elderly people who've been abandoned by their own families. We have people with cognitive disabilities, mental illness, incurable diseases that are wasting away on our streets. If every system is perfectly designed for the result it gets, then what authority created the cruel system to twist power and bring such injustice to our country? We have lots of real victims in homelessness. We have lots of real victims in poverty. We have lots of real victims in trafficking. We have lots of real victims of abuse. 
And the last time I checked, you can't have a victim without an oppressor. Broken people have created a broken world. What are you here for? Can you see oppression? And then God tells Moses the craziest thing. You know, Moses is probably sitting there nodding his head. Maybe he's kind of giving it one of these, and maybe he's amening what God says. Yes, they're in misery. Yes, they're crying. Amen, brother. Yes, they're suffering. Yeah. Yes, they're oppressed. Yes, you're going to rescue them. And God says, I'm sending you. Can you imagine the face he made? Like he's yes in all these things, amening up to this point, and God sends you. He says, I'm going to send you. The question I have for you, are you ready? What kind of face of response did Moses give in that moment? And what will you, your face and your response be in that moment? When all of your plans, all of your dreams don't come true, because God has better plans and a better dream. Where was Moses being sent? He was being sent back where he grew up. Maybe you have plans to run and flee from the memories of your childhood. You left there, you left those people, and it's the last place in the world you ever want to be. I get it. I grew up in a foster home. My biological parents became foster parents. I was surrounded by massive amounts of trauma as a child. Secondary trauma exposure to me is off the charts. We had kids in our home who I grew up with who came from horrible places where they had been abused physically, sexually, exposed to, exposed to crimes beyond comprehension. I had brothers and sisters that were in child porn, brothers and sisters that were sold to the neighbors. Those kids were mentally, emotionally, and physically scarred from head to toe, and I grew up with them. I could tell you stories that would keep you up forever. But when I left home, I never wanted to be around those people again. I never wanted to be around that kind of trauma again. When Moses left Egypt, he probably never wanted to walk into Pharaoh's court again. When you process and work out your childhood or the hood that you grew up in, you never want to go back. Maybe that experience is part of your testimony and where the Lord wants you to serve. My wife had friends in school who used drugs and attempted or committed suicide. And now we work with the same people. We were exposed to his children. It's profound how the Lord uses that ugly stuff from our past to prepare us for the future. I was a software developer. I got tired of working on the next version of an app. I came to seminary. I left all that behind me. I'm never going to do that stuff again. That was the plan. And then you start meeting people and you can't remember which guy's mom's dying of cancer, which guy has got AIDS and, and, and isn't taking his med, and which guy is struggling because he's a sex offender and the whole world rejects him, and which woman was abused, and which woman was sold. And You can't remember all that stuff. In 2010, I was one of those geeks that waited in line for the first iPad. We started building software as soon as it came out. Today, one of our apps, the Our Calling app, is the Yelp of homelessness. Where's the closest homeless shelter? Where's the closest domestic violence center? Where's the closest food pantry? When it first came out, I was like, man, this is cool. It's answering questions that we don't have to talk to people. That's pretty easy. Look at that. It helped 20 people this week. Look at that. It helped 100 people this month. As of today, the app has delivered 26 million referrals across the country, helping people from coast to coast. Police officers use our app. They'll be working with a domestic violence victim. Where do we take this woman? They'll use our app. Are you ready? Are you ready? God may use your past for your future. Moses said to God, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said one of these I statements too. Who should I? Who am I? Why are you sending me? And then God says the most profound statement that we read again later in the New Testament. He says, I will be with you. Do you see misery? Do you hear crying? Are you concerned with suffering? What are you here for? Can you see oppression? Are you ready? And God will be with you. The question I have for you, are you with him? I work at a place called Our Calling, and it may not be your calling. Serving those experiencing homelessness may not be your gig. I get it. But wherever it is, God is speaking and you need to listen because there is misery all over the world. 
There are people crying everywhere. There is suffering in all corners. God is still rescuing and he is still here ready to send you. There's still oppression and he's raising up the church and God's people to right wrongs in the context of the gospel. God is still sending people, not because you're here at DTS, but because you were saved for this very purpose to be his hands and feet. You are saved You are tested, trained, and testifying for him wherever he sends you. There is misery, there's suffering, and there's oppression all around. Maybe God's calling you to help single moms. Maybe God's helping you, calling you to help that small church that's in a rural community that really needs some help. Maybe God's calling you to to step into a ministry that's really hard and you don't know how to do it. He will be with you. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the Great Commission, at the end of that, Jesus says, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Just to review, God said, I have seen misery. I've heard them crying. I'm concerned with suffering. I've come down to rescue. I've seen the oppression. I've sent you to Pharaoh, and I will be with you. Maybe you haven't seen a burning bush or a talking donkey or a light on a road. Maybe the Lord has drawn you back to where you started. Maybe our goal isn't to be Moses. Our goal is just to be faithful wherever he's calling us. The worst part of my job is making that call. But the best part of my job is getting the call. And I get these calls all the time. In fact, all of our staff members do. We have almost 60 staff members. We have 3,500 volunteers a year. And all of us get these calls from time to time. Someone will call and transfer to us. Yeah, John, yeah, I remember you. You used to come to Bible studies and what? What's the Lord doing with you now? You are walking with the Lord. You're reunited with your kids and now you're serving in your church. Praise God. We get those calls all the time. I got a a letter uh, last week from a friend who's in jail about to be released. And he's telling me about how the Lord's moving in his life. He's about to be transferred to a Christian halfway house. I I get messages from people on Facebook. I I got an Instagram message from someone last week. He was talking to me. Now this guy was arrested on a regular basis, less than half a mile from this building. Breaking into buildings all the time, stealing copper, smoking as much crack as he could. But now he's messaging me because he's been clean and walking with the Lord now for about five years. He just celebrated his second wedding anniversary and the Lord is doing amazing miracles in his life. Those are the calls that make it worth it every single day. The worst part of my job is making the call. The best part of my job is getting the call. But not all calls go like that. So I want you to be ready for whatever the call, whenever it comes. It's been a long time since I took a class here and I praise God that I'm not walking into a quiz I'm not prepared for anymore. (laughs) But the last I heard, this place is not just about teaching truth. It's about loving well. And God will call you to love somewhere very well. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your goodness. We praise you that you are still in the business of seeing oppression and misery. You are still in the business of listening to cries and you are still in the business of rescuing and you are still in the business of sending. Lord, there are broken people in every corner of this planet and you are raising redeemed broken people to do your work. So Lord, I pray that you would guide us, that we would hear your voice, that you would speak clearly to us and that we would be willing to go. Lord, I also pray for men, women, and children experiencing homelessness today. Those that are outside, those that are hungry, those that are in fear for their life, those who are being oppressed, those who are being trafficked, those who are being abused, and those who are being neglected. Lord, I also pray for those that will go. We pray, Lord, that you would give us strength to walk and be faithful with wherever you're calling us to be. 
In Jesus' name, amen.